London After Midnight. Many Lost Media friends of mine say that this is the holy grail of Lost Media. I feel like everyone has that one piece of Lost Media that they want to be found, but when it comes to London After Midnight, it seems that everyone recognizes that it's an extremely influential film for not only the movie industry, but the Lost Media community as well. The story behind the film is actually quite an interesting one. There's a massive build-up to a huge outcome, only to end in tragedy. With the loss of various black and white vintage films over these past few decades, I thought covering one of the most important ones of its time would be great to call attention to some of the others that have since vanished from the face of the earth. So today I thought we could take a look into it and explore some possibilities regarding the outcome of what happened to the film. So with that being said, sit back, relax, grab a snack, get some water, maybe make some popcorn, and get cozy. Because today, we're going to explore what happened to London After Midnight. Charles Albert Browning Jr., more well known as Todd Browning, was an American writer, performer, and filmmaker. Born on July 12, 1880 in Louisville, Kentucky, Todd had an astute passion for entertainment. As early as age 16, he would begin his entertainment career joining the circus. This would last him 13 years until he tried his hand in acting in 1909. In 1914, Browning would now begin his work as a director and screenwriter. In 1917, Browning would direct his very first silent film titled Jim Bloodsoe. The film is also lost. What luck! From 1917 through 1918, Browning would work for Metro Pictures. However, he would leave the company in favor of Universal Studios. Due to his various credits and experience, he would soon find himself surrounded by all sorts of individuals in the film industry. One of these individuals would be Lon Chaney, one of the most famous American actors of his time. Cheney and Browning would be working together on films at Universal. By 1925, both Browning and Cheney were working for the newly established Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, or MGM. This is the funny company that had the lion roar through the circle at the start of every Tom and Jerry episode. It's also the company that absorbed Metro Pictures. Ah, full circle. In 1927, Browning and Cheney would work together on a new film based on a story that was written by Browning himself. The story, called The Hypnotist, was to be adapted into a film starring Cheney and directed by Browning called London After Midnight, a mystery horror film that would be Cheney's last major role before passing in 1930. December 11th, 1927 marked the day the film was publicly shown. It was met with different critiques, some saying it was good, others saying it was mediocre. In a Variety article from a paper dated December 14th, 1927, London After Midnight was mentioned. The article said, quote, London After Midnight, Lon Chaney featured not much of a drawing card. Many people think that Browning had attached Chaney's name to the film to attract the more attention to London After Midnight. And yeah, I guess I can understand that thought process. It's like if I attached featuring Markiplier, some super popular YouTuber at the end of the title of my videos. Uh, more people are willing to watch it if it has someone familiar that they recognize in it. Well, according to the Variety article, it claims that although it was riding on the coattails of Cheney's name, it really wasn't that big of a draw to get more people to watch it, so, you know, take that as you will. A lot of things in the film, however, received praise, and it has actually influenced a lot of later horror media that would follow the film. The film was around an hour in length, and in 1935, Browning made a remake of the film titled The Mark of the Vampire. So, critics have considered this piece to be extremely influential, even after the controversial takes on the film's development and what many of the past have had to say about it. Today, many see this piece as a holy grail of lost media, still extremely influential. But why do we say that? And what exactly was this movie about? London After Midnight had an interesting premise, and as mentioned before, it was a mystery horror film. I read this super long summary from IMDb, so I'm gonna try to explain it in a better way than how I read it because I had to go back and read it over like three times. So this guy named Roger Balfour is found dead in his huge mansion with a note claiming he did it himself. The last person to see him is James Hamlin, Balfour's neighbor and the executor of the Balfour estate. The inspector, Edward Burke, begins questioning the people around, including Hamlin, the butler, and Hamlin's nephew, Arthur Hibbs. However, the case goes cold, and we jump ahead five years. Inspector Burke is back on the case after Hamlin reaches out to him, claiming that the new residents of the Balfour Mansion are really suspicious. Hamlin was really just like, hmm, those new neighbors inside their own property are strange. Let's call a private investigator to track their every move. 
weirdo. Apparently, everyone who was questioned before lives in the Hamlin residence now, including the daughter of Roger Balfour, who is now an adult, which means she was at least like 13 when her dad died, so why is there no mention of her in any summary I can find prior to the time skip? Anyways, th the new residents are believed to be vampires, and thus, now we fall into the horror part of the mystery horror category. In this synopsis, it says that this is when we learned that Balfour's body is no longer in the tomb, and that there are stories from the new maid of the Balfour residence about these people having strange supernatural properties. Then, a man who looks strange like Roger Balfour is seen inside the mansion. Burke talks to Balfour's daughter Lucille and tells her to trust him. He uses hypnosis to try to get any information about Balfour from Arthur, however, that gets us nowhere. Then Lucille is kidnapped by the two vampires, who I guess are like a couple, and are brought back to the old house. Inspector Burke tells Hamlin that they need to go to the mansion to get Lucille back which they do. That's when Hamlin is ambushed by one of the vampires, who puts him into hypnosis. Hamlin, in a trance, reveals that he was the one who ended the life of Balfour, all because he wanted to marry Lucille when she was old enough and Balfour refused. It turns out the Inspector Burke had disguised himself as one of the vampires, and the other was played by someone named Luna. The IMDb summary says that it was the new maid who was an assistant detective, but I don't know because honestly the summary is just a little messy, just, just, just a little. Arthur and Lucille end up getting married because they've been in love, and the story ends with that. So I'm just going to say it, I had a hard time trying to comprehend this because it doesn't go into a lot of detail, and to be fair, this is one of the more in-depth summaries of this movie that I could find. Like, the Lost Media Wiki one is just two single paragraphs, and the Wikipedia for the movie is just three paragraphs of, of plot synopsis. Technically, this IMDB one was all one paragraph, but it was it was just like a huge block of text, like, like humongous, absolutely Absolutely humongous. When critics said that it was coasting on the name of Lon Chaney, they had some leverage here since Chaney is literally our main character. Y you know what? He's gonna be on the thumbnail too. There we have it, the plot synopsis. So with such a stunning movie, what happened to it next? MGM was the only known entity to have a copy of this film. I mean, unless you consider the possibility of Browning having a director's cut. I mean, it might be possible. The dude made a bunch of vampire films. He might have just had his own collection for his films. I honestly don't know. I tried to look for any sort of children that Browning may have had with both his first and second wives. However, I can't find any mentions of the chances that he had children. So if he did have a copy of the film, it either went straight to MGM or got passed around the family and is chilling in God knows where. Browning had died in 1962, and in the scenario where the film went straight to MGM, things are not not looking too good for the fate of this film. On August 10th, 1965, an electrical short in MGM Studio Vault 7 would ignite nitrate film. Nitrate film is a sort of material made of, of uh, cellulose nitrate, which is extremely flammable. Like, I cannot stress that enough. It burns extremely quickly and is extremely toxic to breathe. The electrical short caused a fire and also a massive explosion. The explosion resulted in one death and the entire contents of Vault 7 destroyed. This is like the burning of the Library of Alexandria, but for early black and white and silent films. So it's been completely disappeared off the face of the earth, at least on the Browning and MGM side. So I thought I'd take a look at one other thing before we start to talk about what survived, that being the Lon Chaney side. Since Chaney was a good friend of Browning, there's a slight chance that if Browning had a copy, it could have gone to Chaney. And this gets better, considering that Chaney had a son, Lon Chaney Jr., so the film had to go somewhere. Surprisingly enough, the Cheney legacy continues on to this day, with the name still being present and acting. However, they do not have it. I say this because, think about it, it's a film extremely influential to the industry. You're telling me that a literal actor would not release it by now? And this is just assuming that the family didn't just give away their copy because the film had literally no presence after Cheney's passing, outside of the fact that it was his last major role. So, where is this magical film now, if not with the families of those involved and burned to a crisp with the company that had its sole known copy? This is going to be speculation here, but there have been rumors about this film surfacing all over the world. There are crazy rumors, like it being in Cuba, but others say that it's still in the US. The most recent rumor came up in 2021 with an article from the Sitges International Fantastic Film Festival of Catalonia, claiming that it would be showing stuff found from London after midnight in a 16-minute screening. Attached was an image that, prior to the post, was found nowhere else. The film was intended to be shown in 2022, however the date for the 2022 festival has passed. There has also been no mention of any new footage online or shown at the festival, and if it were, 16 minutes do not account for the full length of the 
movie. So, yeah, Film Festival got our hopes up and then didn't reveal any new information. You can't find the article for it anymore. Heck, I had to rely on Discord messages discussing the first mention of the article just to get a good portion of information about the film festival. But from what was said, the film had apparently turned up in South America? I doubt this is talking about London After Midnight, however, as in 2008, the 1927 movie Metropolis had been found in Argentina. Both made in 1927, both influential black and white movies. Amazing. The official release of The Complete Metropolis was done in 2010 under the name The Complete Metropolis, although this doesn't really explain why a film festival would show 16 minutes of it in 2022. So, yeah, that was something. However, despite the film being destroyed and lost, we still have some media like promotional material and even movie stills left of the film. So, let's take a look at those. So, let's start with the posters we have for the movie. There are five total. Each shows Lon Chaney in his disguise, as well as his name on very massive letters. Three of these posters are just cinema posters, one in English, one in Spanish, and one in French. These do a pretty good job of showing off the movie, at least from a poster perspective. You see the main characters, you get a look at the cast, the individuals involved, and yeah, it's definitely a poster. Sorry, I really don't know what to say about these posters. You're just kind of supposed to look at them. That's, that's the gist of them. So now we have cinema lobby cards, which are just smaller ways of promoting a movie than a poster. They show pictures from the movie of the actor and usually have the movie title on them. We have eight of these, so let's just go through each of them. The first one is a version of the poster that's much smaller and shows Cheney as Inspector Burke and Marceline Day as Lucille Balfour. That's pretty much it. The second one is Lon Chaney with two ladies, who I honestly can't figure out who they are. I'm pretty sure it's Lucille and Luna, especially since the caption of the card says, A Prisoner in the House of Mystery. The third one is Inspector Burke hypnotizing Arthur. I say this because Burke is not in disguise like he was when he hypnotized Hamlin. The caption for this card reads, The detective uses hypnotism to run down a criminal. The fourth reads, The detective motioned for silence and shows Burke, Lucille, and who looks like the new maid, Miss Smithson. I am a little confused though, as Burke looks significantly different here than he does in the third card, but hey, that could, that could be by choice. The, the fifth is Burke and Lucille, with Lucille hiding behind Burke while he holds a cane. The caption reading, He awaited the mysterious attacker. Not really sure what this is. I'm guessing the vampires are attacking them. I don't know. The sixth is three men. I'm assuming Burke, Arthur, and Hamlin all gathered against a wall. It's worth noting that near Burke is what appears to be a sword of some sort. The caption reads, they were trapped. That That's it. The seventh is five men. One is Burke, one is Hamlin, two detectives, and the strangest one is the one on the far right. The caption reads, You killed him, as the detectives arrest Hamlin. The man on the far right, however, appears to be Roger Balfour? I say this because the man looks identical to Claude King, the man who played Roger Balfour. The eighth and final card is who I'm guessing to be Lucille and Arthur, but I can't read the caption because the image is so small and zooming does nothing. I'm gonna assume this is from the wedding at the very end. There are 19 movie stills. Since they're actual stills from the movie, they're in way better quality than those cinema lobby cards. So this first one is Lon Chaney in his vampire disguise, and man, you can just tell that he's into this role. Like, he is getting into it. That smile, the wings, the hat, just amazing. The next is kind of like a poster. It has Lon Chaney's name at the top, and London After Midnight right underneath that. And then another picture of Chaney posing in disguise. The third is him in disguise yet again, this time in a new pose. Those wings look super goofy by today's standards, but it looks like he was having fun, so I, th that's good. The fourth is an up-close look at Chaney in disguise, showing his razor-sharp vampire teeth and the bags underneath his eyes. Amazing. The fifth is another up-close shot of Chaney, and yeah, there's not really much to be said about these two headshots. The sixth is quite important because of where it came from. It showed up on a forum site from a private collector. Yeah, I haven't found too much information on this, so it's not really a good lead anymore. It shows three individuals from left to right. It looks like Arthur, Hamlin, and Burke. It looks like Burke is accusing Arthur or something, and they're arguing. That That's about it for that one. The seventh still is actually still the same scene, except this time Burke is in a different stance. That's all. The eighth is another one from the private collector. It shows Burke talking to Lucille in what looks like some sort of garden. Wherever it is, it's exterior, and we get to see Burke's cane fascinating. 
The ninth is another exterior shot with Burke in his vampire disguise along with Luna and her vampire disguise. Burke is behind her and pointing at the camera with a big toothy smile. The tenth shows Burke and Luna once again, this time outside some sort of large doorway with Burke holding a lantern to light the way. This is a massive interior of the mansion as we'll be able to see another still here in a second. The eleventh has Burke holding the lantern over a passed out Lucille while Luna inspects her. She's passed out on this really nice couch, I mean... Like, man, that looks really comfortable. If you ignore all those cobwebs over to the left, you know, you got yourself a good place. The 12th shows Burke behind Lucille as she stares ahead with the most blank stare in her eyes. I think she might be hypnotized, maybe? I honestly don't know, but man, look at the set design. Look at those cobwebs. The 13th is Burke, Lucille, and Luna once again as the three of them are still in the mansion. Burke and Luna appear to be talking to Lucille, but that's about it. The 14th is my favorite for cinematography. You have this shot that's looking up from the base of the stairs, and at the top are Burke and Luna, with the only source of light being the lantern. It does a good job of showing them in a menacing way, the way they just stand there looking down at the camera. It's, it's just amazing. The 15th is Burke, Luna, and Lucille yet again, and this time it looks like Lucille is trying to reason with Burke. She has her hands out, almost pleading, while Burke psychotically looks at this lantern and Luna grasps on the Lucille. I honestly wish I knew the purpose of that lantern, it looks pretty important. Might just be the generic spooky lantern though, who knows. The 16th shows Burke back at the doorway again, turned around and shining the light in the direction of the camera. Not much to say about that. The 17th is Inspector Burke in his normal attire outside some sort of library or bookstore with a sign in the window. The 18th is Burke in disguise next to two detectives in an exterior environment, with the two detectives looking clearly confused by the disguise Burke has on. The 19th and final still is of a disguised Burke outside the mansion, slightly crouched and with a large smile on his face. The exterior shot is pretty cool considering how zoomed out from Burke we actually are, so it shows in comparison how big the mansion is to an average person. And man, it's pretty cool to see these zoomed out shots of this place. Just look how dilapidated this place is. Anyways, that's all the promotional media that we have for this movie, so I think it's time to move on to our conclusions. Okay, so this is last minute sewer reviewer. Very last minute, last minute editing, almost done with the video, and I found 18 minutes worth of footage. Footage, I use that very lightly here, but an 18 minute long YouTube video that has all sorts of stills that aren't even featured in the wiki. So, I mean, I really apologize for not showing these on screen. Had I known that they had existed, you know, I, I probably would have used them, but, um, yeah, the majority of the stuff I got was from the wiki, however, I did get a lot of other research from other sites, but I just found this 18-minute video that has all these stills, and it kind of contradicts everything I just said, so I'll be sure to link it in the description below, um, and, you know, I'll put it in a pinned comment or something, I don't know. Once again, sorry about this, uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's move on with the video. So what happened to London after midnight? Well, lost, obviously, but with the disappearance of the film, it opened so many new avenues on where it could be. Whenever I find myself talking about this movie, I always think back to Metropolis, a film made at the same time that somehow found its way onto the other side of the world. When we think about how there was a chance London after midnight could have been somewhere like Spain, I think we start to think about how far this movie spread, like who all could have seen it. With the master copy that MGM had suddenly bursting into flames, I think the only leads we would be able to track is where the film had been shown after its debut and try to find it that way. It could be on the other side of the world without us knowing, or it could be in someone's closet collecting dust. With early lost films, the possibilities are endless. And yeah, that's my take on London After Midnight. I honestly like to talk about all these early lost films because of how much they have affected the entertainment industry as a whole. Anyways guys, if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to leave a like and tell me what you think in the comments below. If you want to hear more of my horrendous opinions, consider following me on my social media. My links are in the description below and on top of the screen. Also, maybe consider subscribing. It's free and you can click that bell icon to be notified of my next upload. Anyways, as always guys, it's been a blast and I will see you all next time. Next time. Peace.